Bonjour Welcome to this interview to France 24 and Radio France International. We are at the UN headquarters. Our guest today is the Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez. Thank you for being here. Pleasure to be here. This is Christophe Boisbouvier from RFI. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary General. Good afternoon. We are on the eve of the General Assembly, and clearly Ukraine will be one of the main themes of this General Assembly. I'd like to ask you what was discovered in the city of Izium, an area that was reconquered by the Ukrainian forces from the Russian forces. Ukrainian authorities claim to have found hundreds of bodies, and some of them showed signs of having been executed and tortured. Vladimir Zelensky said that Russians are torturers. Leaders of the European Union uh, claim that Russians, including their leaders, should be held accountable. Well, first and foremost, uh, throughout this war in Ukraine, we have seen constant examples of violations of human rights and international humanitarian law. So when we learnt of these recent events, uh, uh, the, Hu the High Commission for Refugees has decided to actually head to site to verify the information. And I also hope uh, that the ICC... Yes, the International Criminal Court. Yes, the International Criminal Court will be able to head out to site, and it is in fact the best instrument we have to be able to hold people accountable. So they need to be able to carry out a serious investigation and then after to have everything in place so that the responsible parties can be held accountable. On the war front, there is still fighting going on. Vladimir Zelensky is trying to double down on his winning streak. Vladimir Putin replies in a threatening tone. We'll see how the Ukrainian counter-offensive will end up. We are not in a rush. What about the odds of a peace agreement? Are they not lower than ever? Do you not fear a military escalation that might end up in a nuclear conflict? I fear military escalation, and I believe that the eventuality that nuclear warheads may be used is something that is entirely unacceptable. It's such an awful possibility, and I truly hope that it is never truly considered by any party. But as you said, the perspectives that we have for a peace deal, they are far from reality. I think that both the Ukrainians and the Russians believe that they will win this war. And I don't foresee any serious possibility to have in the very near future a true peace negotiation process. As regards the nuclear issue, we mentioned that. In a very concrete way, the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, which is the biggest in Europe, is at stake. We know that IAEA had an on-site mission. We learned on Saturday that the plant was reconnected to the grid, but still there is a threat. You wanted a demilitarized belt around the plant, but we are, this is still a remote perspective, isn't it? Uh, it is very much a remote perspective. We made a proposal before the UN Security Council, and that was first. We have to come to an agreement that no one will bomb the facility or no one will use the facility to launch missiles from. It's uh, obvious. And second, we have to place a perimeter around the area so that Russian forces can withdraw from this site. And on the other side, the Ukrainians have to commit to not taking back the facility with their armed forces. The facility has to be purely civilian. It is what we need for us to be able to ensure that the facility can be recommissioned.
On the 22nd of July in Istanbul, thanks to your mediation and the mediation by the Turkish president, an agreement was hammered out between Russians and Ukrainians to enable the export of Ukrainian wheat and Russian fertilizer. However, last Wednesday, I think it was, Vladimir Putin said on the phone that this agreement was not working for two reasons. First, because the Ukrainian wheat was exported more towards Europe than towards Africa. And also because Russian wheat and fertilizers could not be exported because they were blocked by the West. Is that true? It's partially true. However, we are working through a number of these issues. First of all, there is not one agreement, but two agreements. There is an agreement for Ukrainian exports, which is an agreement between Russia, Ukraine, the United Nations and Turkey. And there's also an agreement between the United Nations and Russia. And as part of that agreement, the United Nations are going to do their utmost to, to work with the European Union, USA and other countries that have put in place sanctions so that what we say publicly will always be put into action so that they won't be sanctions on fertilizers and food, for example. But in practice, there are a number of issues that are indirectly related to that. For example, payments, insurance, access to ports as well. And that final one is an issue because a lot of these exports actually transit through countries such as the European Union. And we are undertaking serious negotiation with the United States and the European Union. And I really believe that we are on track to resolving these remaining issues. Currently, we desperately need fertilizers. The international fertilizer market is in dire straits. In Africa, we see all throughout the continent that harvests are coming in lower than last year. So we need to bring back a level of normalcy to the fertilizer market. And at the same time, we also need to draw attention to the fact that there have been food exports coming out of Ukraine. And those exports have been going to all countries, European countries, other high-income countries, but also exports to middle-income countries such as China, India and Egypt, and even to low-income countries. Now, as regards the nuclear agreement in Iran, there were negotiations and people were hopeful, but apparently the hopes for an agreement are being lost. In New York, the main players for those negotiations will be here. Are you hopeful that we can finally make some headway? I am constantly in contact with Iran and with other countries that are part of the negotiation process in the United Nations are not directly involved in it. And to be perfectly honest with you, as of two weeks ago, I was convinced that we were about to reach an agreement. But then things got a bit complicated. I still do have hope. But I do feel that there are major hurdles that still need to be overcome, and we need concerted effort to be able to overcome them. I do think, now I've forgotten what the term is in French, the JCPOA. Yes, the nuclear agreement with Iran. Exactly, the nuclear deal. I believe that that was one of the major diplomatic success stories of recent history. And it is a great shame that the United States pulled out of it. We saw the Iranian reaction to that, how they started up their nuclear activities once again. It is truly vital that we get that agreement back on track. It truly is vital. And I do hope that this week will be an opportunity to make some headway. Following deadly floods in Pakistan, you went there, that was a few days ago, and you denounced the disastrous impact of GHS 
gas emissions. In Glasgow, during the COP26 last year, developed countries committed themselves to pay every year $40 billion to the poorest countries in order to adapt themselves. Are the promises that were made about to be held? I think the fundamental issue when it comes to the fight against climate change is that where we are currently standing, we are in a disastrous current situation. We drastically need to immediately reduce CO2 emissions. We've seen the devastating effects in Pakistan with the floods, but there's also drought throughout Africa, four-year-long drought in the Horn of Africa. So when we have to decrease emissions by 45 percent by 2030, we also have to take into account that in, despite those commitments, there are also growth perspectives of 14 percent. It's suicidal. Secretary General, the High Commissioner on Human Rights published a very expected report on crimes committed by China in Xinjiang. That report mentions mass detention of populations and also the possibility of uh, crimes against mankind. You incited China to implement the recommendation of that report. Obviously, China refused. Are we going to leave it at that? We're talking about possible crimes against mankind. Should we uh, ask for more? Well, as you know, there are instruments in place to tackle these sorts of issues. Now, our current position is very clear. The Uyghur people need to be able to ensure that their human rights are respected, but more than that, this community needs to feel that their identity, be it cultural or religious, is also respected. And they need to be able to feel part of society as a whole. They need to be welcomed within society. And I truly hope that this issue, which is a fundamental issue, be effectively resolved. And as I said, there are international bodies in place that can help with that process. In Haiti, the rise in fuel prices over the last few days has triggered riots, pilfering. You called on all the parties to fend off the crisis. Should we start again subsidization of uh, fuel prices for the poorest and you manage to obtain the commitment of several million dollars, but that is that enough? Well, I would say that uh, in principle, we should subsidize families, not fuel. And it's different. Because when you subsidize a family, those families can have the necessary means and resources that they need. And the subsidies aren't going to translate into profits for the fossil fuel companies. But in the case of Haiti, and we met on numerous occasions with the UN Security Council, is that what we have to have in the country is security. And I made a proposal at the time, and we need a true international support program to help Haiti train and equip their police force. But what we also need within that perspective is a robust force that will be able to fight against the gang presence in the country. And we all have a police in Portugal and France. We have police forces that are very robust. So I think in Haiti, as part of this transition phase, while their police force are being trained and equipped to be fully effective, we need another force, a temporary force, to bring order back to the country, to the towns, to the countryside as well so that they can fight against these gangs. It's not a political movement, these are gangs. And unfortunately, sometimes these gangs have in ways with people with economic and political power in the country. We don't have much time left. We'd I'd like to talk about Africa, Mali. There is a diplomatic crisis currently with the Ivory Coast. Mali has detained 46 Ivorian soldiers. 
They call them mercenaries. Ivory Coast says no, they were employed by MINUSMA. Are they mercenaries? No, it's perfectly clear that they're not mercenaries. And I call on the authorities in Mali for an end to be brought to this situation. You talked to them? You spoke with the Ivorian president? Yes, we're in constant contact with them. Mr. Goita? No, I didn't speak directly with uh, Mr. Goita, but we're in constant contact with the delegations and actually will receive the Malian delegation. Because for me, it is such a fundamental point. We have to resolve the issue. And secondly, Secondly, we must recognize the fact that the situation in the Sahel region is a very difficult situation. In the east of the DRC, people are demonstrating against peacekeepers. They accuse them of not protecting them against rebels. There were uh, people dead during demonstrations in July. Will you be considering an early departure of those peacekeepers before 2024, or even before uh, the presidential elections, before the end of 2023, as requested by several authorities? There is a plan to progressively pull out forces from the country. But let's speak honestly about the situation. The people, the people really desire and hope for the UN forces to be able to fight against these, the movements that are in the country, the, the violent groups, and to provide them with protection. But the situation is very complex. You have the M23, and as you know, they are the reason behind the latest protests, because the United Nations can't effectively fight against the M23, and the truth is the M23 is an armed force, modern, heavily equipped armed force, and they're even better equipped than MONUSCO. Do they come from Rwanda? They come from somewhere. Is that a yes? Well, somewhere close. Well, obviously, they didn't just appear in the forest out of nowhere. They come from somewhere. But what we absolutely need, in my opinion, is that we have to find a way of having serious discussion between the Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda, so that we can all come to some form of agreement to avoid this constant fighting, which means that whenever we take one step forward, we take three steps back. These countries need to come to an understanding and they need to work together effectively to ensure security in the east of Congo, but also to ensure security and safety for Uganda and Rwanda. Obviously, we mustn't forget that ADF is a movement that comes from Uganda, and you still have in uh, Congo FDLR representatives. FDLR, I'm sure you're familiar with it. And they were a movement that came out of the Hutu uh, people who are responsible for the genocide. So for all of these countries, they need to understand each other. Because the peacekeeping forces can solve problems and provide security. But when you have well-armed military forces, it's almost impossible. Secretary General, thank you for granting us this interview. Thank you to the audience for watching us on France 24 and RFI.